so how exactly did I even become a coral farmer in the first place? Because I, growing up, had absolutely no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was extremely aimless, and I was just very lucky that I had the flexibility to bounce around a number of careers and burning them all down as I went before eventually landing on coral farming. But the one continuous thread was that I was a hobbyist and I had this little side hustle in the background that one day had enough momentum that I could quit my corporate day job and basically escape that whole rat race, right? The real, I guess, launching point for all that was I was in business school. In business school, they sometimes have like these business plan competitions. And I'm like, sure, I wanted to see what it would look like if I took my hobby and scaled it up to something that could be like a real, you know, a real boy business. I happened to win about $30,000 in these business plan competitions. And at the time, I wasn't making any sales or anything like that. So really all that money was just being burned on electric and gas bills just to keep stuff going. So the, the money in itself wasn't as big of a deal as it might have seemed. But the real big thing that those, um, the business plan competitions and stuff did was it kind of made everybody around me buy into the whole concept of a coral farm. Because it went from, this is a dumb idea, you're wasting your time and education on this, to, oh my gosh, the entire business community has said this is a great idea and now we believe. You really can't start a business without a tremendous support system. So I would say that just that, that little academic exercise is the thing that really launched this company because without the help that I got initially, it, it just wouldn't have happened. The first thing that we did was we put together a greenhouse system. Now, this was probably back in 2002, so close to 20 years ago. And a lot of the, the assumptions that went into building a greenhouse to do coral farming really don't apply so much today because Back then, there weren't even like commercially available LEDs. Like we were talking about metal halides, we were talking about not even T5s, like T12 VHOs, like the big guys. And so a, a lot of like the, the business calculation stuff really was anticipating how much money could we save by using the sun instead of all these expensive lights that required expensive bulb replacements, they required a lot of electricity and a lot of heat management, especially on this type of scale, right? And the thinking at the time with the greenhouse is you're talking about a, like basically the best light on the best timer, blah, 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 blah. That did not quite work out. So the first lesson, I guess, is always challenge these assumptions and you kind of have to just to roll with it because there's so many obstacles that we had doing greenhouse aquaculture. Like from day one to wherever the heck we are now, day 20 years later, uh, it is unrecognizable because we use mostly artificial light in our greenhouse. And so we now aren't really benefiting from the sun because it turns out that the difference between summertime sun and wintertime sun, pretty significant in Ohio. Like you get eight hours more sun just from you know, winter to going to summer. The intensity quadruples, so you really have a difficult time controlling all that, and it turns out that corals really hate inconsistency. On top of that, you have to be prepared for the worst day in the summer and the worst day in the winter. So you have to be prepared for the day that's 110 degrees outside and the electricity cuts out and you have to find a way to cool down your tanks in a greenhouse. And you also have to be able to, when it's negative 10 degrees outside and your heater fails, how are you going to save your greenhouse? It takes one bad day to essentially eliminate everything. So again, we have all of those challenges plus effectively no benefit from the sun. Good times, right? Good times. So about three years ago, we decided to build a whole new headquarters. So the nice thing about the greenhouse is that it was like a great proof of concept. And we learned so many things going from the greenhouse system to a future system that we could build and pretty much fix all those dumb things that we did along the way. And like I said, three years ago, we started on this, uh, on this new building. It is roughly 10,000 square feet, about 9,000 square feet. Uh, and the, the funny story about how this got started was 
a, uh, another coral farm somewhat local to us was expanding their farm. And they were working with a contractor, and, we, and sometimes we talk and share numbers, and they said that it, the, their expansion, just to, just to build it out, was going to be about $80,000. Now, at the time, I didn't just have 80 grand sitting around or anything like that. But my parents, who were, had joined me on this trip to this coral farm, they're like, we could possibly do something like that. And I'm also just thinking, like, there's nothing about this that's going to cost 80 grand. Like, maybe it's just a shell or something, but I, I'm, I'm really not into this at all, right? But they kind of were really excited about it, and they're like, you know what? We, if, we, if we just like do this shell, you can fill it with all your tanks and stuff later, you know, and you can be responsible for that part. And I'm like, I still don't think any part of this is going to be 80 grand, okay? The funny thing about all of this is, I'm just going to share some actual numbers. It was probably a million dollars. It might be more. I really stopped counting a long time ago. If you were to tell me from day one that in three years, uh, the real price tag is going to be like a million dollars. Clearly on day one, the answer is no, this is not. I didn't have 80 grand. I definitely didn't have a million, right? So easily answers no. But it's like, you know, how do you eat an elephant or whatever that, that phrase is, you, you know, like one bite at a time. So it turns out if you start even mistakenly with something like that and you just kind of chip away and at the end of the three years, you ended up spending the money and now you have it. The answer now is absolutely. I have zero regrets to doing this. But that's just kind of how, how that all worked out. We are about 50% full on, on this uh, new system now. We went with a bunch of custom glass tanks and everything. And we went just uh, top tier construction on as much as we could because I learned a lot from the greenhouse about uh, making the space a very livable and workable space for human beings. I think that. Um, early on, a lot of the decisions that we were making really were because we didn't have any space. But now that we did have space, we could spend a lot more time thinking about how, you know, like human beings really are going to be working in this. Also, funny story, I ended up being the general contractor for this project. And that was not intended. I thought that the builder was the general contractor. And he was just like, well, you have your electrician and plumber lined up because we need to like do the groundwork and everything like that right now. And I'm like, I know nothing, absolutely nothing. But apparently I need to hire a plumber immediately. And uh, so a lot of like the, the planning details to something like this, it was a big time adventure because I'm not able to plan every little detail out in advance because ideally you would have great, I mean, the, the complexity of like tens of thousands of gallons of aquaculture systems, you want to have as much planned out as you can beforehand. But in practice, I'm kind of glad that we made a very, very, very basic structure. And then from that, uh, we just kind of like lived in the space because a lot of the stuff that we were thinking about on day one simply wouldn't have worked out. And by just kind of like having the time to like just chill out for a second and and really just see like walking around constantly and, and just pondering all the different options, we ended up with something much, 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 much better just by kind of like piecemealing the project as we went. But so you can guys can kind of see the, the video of us kind of just putting everything together from scratch, essentially. Now, a big choice that we had to make was what, what type of um, container to, to, to do all this coral farming in. Because if you look at like worldwide corals, they use a lot of uh, fiberglass tubs. If you look at uh, other different coral farms, they use like Rubbermaid stock tanks. And that's the sort of stuff that we did as well in our greenhouse. Because that stuff is like extremely inexpensive per gallon of water. But over the years, I've realized that observation is the ultimate key that you need to have, especially when you're talking about coral farming because it's the, the, the invitation of neglect that's the real problem here. It's not like a, a home aquarium where, I'm sure you've heard that phrase like, just keep your hands out of the tank and everything will be better. That works on a single small scale, 100 gallon tank or so. In a coral farming environment, the more that you get, can get your hands in and touching the corals, the better. Because neglect is the thing that's gonna cause 
all of your headaches. Because that little corner that kind of gets ignored, that is where some awful thing is going to start and spread to the rest of your tank. So the more that we can get in there, the more that we can dote on everything, the, the easier everything is going to be. So I insisted that we have to have glass everything. Like we need to be able to see all the little nooks and crannies. This is still a hotly debated topic in aquaculture. Like don't even get it twisted. People either love their, their, their tubs or they, they're crazy and they do this glass stuff like we did. Now a big like I guess fundamental thing going from the greenhouse to the new building was kind of like the use of, of the space for human beings rather than just trying to optimize every square inch of it for aquariums. So one of the things, oversized walkways. There's so many, and I'm, I'm talking about like high-end coral farms, that their, their walkways are super tiny, and now they have to get four people holding buckets past each other on a constant basis. Friction just like never really works out super duper well. The other thing is the optimal height of the tanks. Because in the greenhouse, we actually did like a multi-tiered tank system to make best use of like the square footage. I have a, a friend in town, he has his own store, and he is the exact opposite to me going to this. Because I'm like, there is a perfect height for these tanks. And we will have one layer of tanks, okay? He is the exact opposite. He wants four levels of tanks. And he constantly complains to me about his staff because the middle tank is clean. It's like the, the top tank, the, the bottom two tanks, they're gross as all heck. And he's like, I tell my guys to clean this. They, I, I, I can't stand how they never lose it. I'm like, you made it too difficult. <laughs> you made it way too difficult for them. One height, guys, one. <laughs> okay, this is actually somewhat more, perhaps more applicable for, for like someone with a home aquarium, is people don't really get the importance of space behind a tank. Like sometimes I get it, you might, the, the, the room space might be smaller, you have to press that sucker up against the wall. You really want to be able to walk behind your tank. <laughs> There's a lot of craziness that goes on back there. You really want to be able to get behind there and fix stuff from that perspective. Possibly even like stepping onto something and working down from the backside of that aquarium. So like a big uh, portion of, of how we went about designing a lot of what we were doing was this idea of like this kind of a 360 access to all the aquariums. Next thing, workstations. A lot of focus gets put on, on the tanks, getting the, the, the tanks settled in and using as much of the floor space as possible on tanks. We actually have to do work. There needs to be places for people to work at. So there is a, an, an enormous, and I mean an absolutely like enormous amount of, of space allocated to just like workstations. Because it turns out access to sinks and access to desk spaces is like the Hamptons of the entire building. So if I were to recommend anything about like a home aquarium, I would have as close as possible, like think about routing like places to just to set things, like your, your test kits, your food, like prioritize that, that type of thing. And that's why I'm a big fan of like Euro braces versus rimless because it's a shelf, you know, right, right next to your tank. The other thing is about access to sinks when you're like just locating a tank and finding a spot for it. Some folks are like, oh, I got the perfect spot. It's upstairs in, in my like master bedroom or, or something to that effect. And it's like, where exactly were you planning on getting water to that? It's like now they're carrying buckets, possibly from the laundry room in the basement, all the way up there. It's a, like a total nightmare. So yeah, again, think human spaces because you have to do work on these tanks. It's a lot of work. One big thing that I noticed, uh, especially with like a lot of different coral farms, and this is when you start to talk about like having multiple systems. They will have a long raceway of tanks that terminate a, with a, some kind of sump against a wall or something like that. And what you end up having, if you imagine like this room, for example, would be the coral farm and the, and the rows of, of seats are the, the different aquarium systems. You would have sumps lining the entire perimeter of this room. And when it comes time, again, work, maintenance and whatnot, now to clean skimmers, you're going all the way around this place. So what we did to, to kind of like alleviate that in our building is that we effectively had all of the systems kind of point in 
to one central location that has all the utility stuff right there. So cleaning skimmers for us, and, or maintaining reactors or anything, everything is within 15 feet. So for all the different, like, thousands of gallons of aquariums, they all come back to one central spot for maintenance. So perhaps a takeaway to that is if you do have like multiple systems, perhaps you know, like think ahead to routing plumbing, even if it is a long way to come back to a central location that is close to all your utility stuff. Because like one of our tanks is like a big SPS show tank. It's probably about 600 gallons. To send water to it and to have it drain back, we have it going along the wall and literally it is about 60 feet away from the sumps. But yeah, everything goes back to a central location that, that's easier to maintain. This is gonna apply to almost nobody. But packing. We spend about four hours a day doing packing. And in our greenhouse, we basically didn't have a location to do any of this. We just kind of had did it where we, where we could. In the new place, knowing that we have so much going on with, uh, with packing now, I wanted just everything to be opulent. Anything that my guys have to constantly touch to that degree. So like this packing station is like aluminum and granite. It's like spectacular, it's so nice. And we're putting in a new set of tanks right there. So pretty much the website is gonna be represented in the tank. So my guys don't have to run five miles a day to the different parts of the farm to go consolidate all the orders and stuff like that for today. This is where I, uh, I burn myself to the ground. We have to do a lot of quarantining of corals and, and fish. It's very, very, very challenging for us to, to clean everything through and through. So we actually go through like a 72 day quarantine process. We are constantly treating, re remounting corals before they're allowed into our growing systems. Having said that, stuff still makes it through all that to such a degree that in our fish quarantine system that literally has not seen anything other than fish and PVC pipe, we found Aptasia. So in addition to the corals going through that 72 day quarantine and systems that literally never see corals, a random pest will just pop out of nowhere. Even though I'm saying that like, it's super difficult to stop everything, it's still super worth it because if you can stop one thing, it, is, it, it, it validates all of it. Because pretty much any, any big coral farm at scale will have a little baseline amount of pests. It just is. They might say they don't, trust me, trust. They all do, I definitely do. But the, but the real big difference in, it's, it, it's in the nuance because the pest level it is managed because if it was completely out of control, that place simply would not exist. The, the type of pests that you really want to avoid, they will shut your business down fast. Like you just won't have corals to sell. So even though we do talk about like, like baseline pest issues and, and trying to control all that, it is largely under control. So I cannot stress enough. You have to try, if at all possible, to again, prevent pests you know, for just at your tank level and then rely on, on just good vendors upstream because the, the type of headaches that you're going to be getting from like an outbreak of like Acropora eating flatworms or nudibranchs or whatever, it's such a headache. So yeah, whatever you can do up front, the better. So one thing that we did learn is that's hyper effective because let's say, for example, that I do have some, some random flatworm that pops up. Well, in the past, what we would do is we would literally take and dip every single tray in a 300 gallon system, for example. It was sort of effective, you know, a whole, like a bunch of, uh, a bunch of stuff will come out in the dip, you, you, you pat yourself on the back, like, yeah, you know, I'm putting in that effort, right? But within like a couple of days, you just might see another flatworm just pop up on the glass. And it's like, huh, okay, well, that's a thing. So what we started to do was to pretty much take everything out of the tank, scrape it down, dip the corals, you know, uh, like locate the fish into some aerated buckets, fresh water and vinegar bath the tank for a couple hours, refill it, put the corals back, and that was highly effective. That buys you a good month and a half before you see another flatworm pop up on the glass. But that is better than one day, right? 
so I think long term, one of the, the things that we're going to be looking at doing is just to simply have one tank in a particular system be follow, meaning completely empty and dry. And no matter what, we will just have that dry and then rotate one tank uh, full of corals into that, break that tank down, dry it, leave that fallow, and then just go through that rotation. So effectively, once, once maybe every few months, it's going to get rotated out. So we could just do one of these a day and just constantly rotate, 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 rotate. And that is highly, highly, highly effective when it comes to, like, to basically dropping like, any type of pest issue practically down to nothing. I'm sure that they're still there. I'm sure if allowed to persist, they will come back. But this is like the nuclear option as far as that stuff goes. The problem with doing that, our systems, they are, they are an ecosystem, right? Especially with larger aquariums. And there are a lot of benefits to all of this microfauna that you might not be paying attention to. So when we do hard nuke these tanks and really start from this laboratory clean baseline, it creates like a power vacuum, which I call the Batman problem. Because like if, you, if you're familiar with like, you know, Batman lore, effectively he starts out just trying to like fight like the mafia or something, you know, like just general random run of the mill criminals and just beat them up. And after he pretty much eliminates all those, you know, random thug scumbags, now you get super villains taking their place, right? And so this is what typically happens when I nuke these tanks too, too hard. It's this open invitation for the really weird stuff to start to grow. So we get like some weird, like insane giant, what do you call it? A polyclad flatworm or these spiders that would never otherwise pop up. But you just get the weird stuff because probably what was happening was like the larvae of these things was just getting eaten by amphipods or something. So like in a regular tank, you would never see this stuff. But starting from this laboratory setting where, you know, anything's, anything goes, sometimes you start to get like the weird stuff popping up. The other lesson that I learned is it's really easy, especially for me that doesn't get out a lot, to, to kind of get insular in, in what I think is kind of just... A, you know, normal, right? It's like, I, I see my corals every day, I know what to expect. And it is something I need to work on more is to get out and actually look at other people's farms. This is me at Worldwide Corals, I visited Top Shelf, I visited, oh, what's it called, um, Cherry Corals, just to see like how they're doing things and getting like a visual reference as to like what is possible for, for certain corals. Because um, even like one of my friends, we sold him some zoanthids and he later sold them back to us and they were like five times the size. So it's like, okay, what did you do differently? Because like, we are definitely not getting that kind of growth. So I couldn't uh, recommend enough just to get out there, do tank tours, like see, if, if, see if people are, are, are coming around and, and showing off their aquariums. Again, just kind of like constantly like seeing what's out there and what, what's going on. Coming to the end here, uh, keeping a log a visual log of what is going on in your tanks. Because uh, we're actually pretty bad at remembering um, what's, what stuff was. So we're, we're, I guess we're lucky that we take tens of thousands of photos. We have a YouTube channel that I can like go back and refer to a lot of the, the imagery and the videography and, and seeing, oh, I remember now, that's what that looked like at such and such time. Because I, b before I did this, I was talking to a buddy, and he had a red Ganyapora in his tank. And the next time I saw him, I was like, hey, uh, I remember that you had this cool red Ganyapora. How's that doing? And he's like, Than, I never had a red Ganyapora. And he flips open uh, some, uh, some files, and, it's, and, and sure enough, there's this old photo of his tank. That Ganyapora was green. In my brain, I turned it into a red Ganyapora. Yeah, so whenever possible, like just, just, just keep, keep a log. You know, social media, for all of its faults, is pretty good for this. It, it almost forces you to, like, to just capture your tank over time. And sometimes you think that, like, oh, things are doing great now. But when you look back, oh, it might have been doing a little bit better five months ago. 
or I think things are going like trash now. You look back five months ago, no, actually everything grew double in size. Things are pretty good, pretty good. And so just don't, don't rely on your memory on a lot of this stuff. Just having that visual log is incredibly, incredibly helpful. But I guess like the, the most, most, most important thing that I can think of, especially with, with me having to build out this project, is just to have patience with the process. I, I think everybody wants to start in on like this magnificent reef project, whether it's, it's on the coral farming side or whether it's on just like a home aquarium scale. But really, I can't stress this enough, the journey itself is the reward in all this. Like, because I don't know about you guys, but once I'm done with my systems, like the novelty immediately wears off. Like to, to have like a finished tank that's full, it's like, like my interest kind of just, uh, just drops right off. So even though this is taking like me three years of a million delays and whatnot, I'm, I'm fully enjoying the process. So even though it's like super frustrating to try to like, you know, have contractors work on some of this stuff because everybody calls off these days, it's, you know what? As long as it gets done eventually, I'll be, I'll be really happy. Because this all got started pre-COVID. You know, back then I could actually get stuff done. Now, I, I actually, I'm also super happy that I did get started pre-COVID. Because nowadays, this thing would have cost triple and it would have probably had another two years of extra delays in the process. But here we are. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of the show.